So in this final video for lecture five, it turns out that there is a, another version of the induction axiom uh, referred to as the well-ordering principle. This one's a little, is crafted a little bit differently. So let me first define what a well-ordered set is. Um, so first of all, let S be a partially ordered set. We will properly define this later on. Basically it just means that if we have elements X and Y, we can decide if X is less than or equal to Y. We'll, we'll define what that is more properly later on, but we've probably seen something like this before. We say that a set is well-ordered if every non-empty subset contains a least element. So if you take any subset of the set, there's always a smallest element uh, inside that set. The natural numbers are a well-ordered set. And so this is called the well-ordering principle. Any The set of natural numbers is well-ordered. If you take any subset, of natural numbers that's not empty, there always will be a smallest natural number inside of that set. It turns out that the well-ordering principle uh, is equivalent to the induction axiom. The natural numbers, in fact, is the canonical example of a well-ordered set. Well-ordered sets are trying to generalize this principle for the natural numbers. Uh, and, and the, the well-ordering principle is equivalent to uh, the induction hypothesis on the natural numbers. Now, when I talk about the well-ordering principle for the natural numbers, that is not the same thing as the well-ordering principle for the real numbers. The well-ordering principle in that context is actually, for the real numbers, is equivalent to the axiom of choice, which is a much much deeper mathematical topic that I'm not talking about right here. The well-ordering principle of the natural number is actually just the induction, the induction hypothesis. I'm sorry, the induction, the induction principle. Um, and this can be sh the equivalence of the well-ordering principle with the induction uh, principle is really just by showing a statement is true by induction if and only if the tr it's true by looking at the smallest counterexample argument. So what do we mean by the smallest counterexample? Smallest counterexample. We'll do a proof of this in just a second. Uh, so this is a proof by contradiction. In which case, you're like, hmm, if a statement is true for all natural numbers, let's prove this by contradiction, all right? Let's prove, let's assume the statement's not true for all natural numbers. Well, by the well-ordering principle, if the statement is not true for some natural numbers, there's a smallest natural number where that statement is not true. So the smallest counterexample, okay? The well-ordering principle gives us that. And then you argue that... The, taking your smallest counterexample, that its predecessor as a natural number is also a counterexample, thus violating that we have the smallest counterexample present. And so you can argue, logically speaking, that this well-ordering principle is equivalent to the induction argument, the induction proofs we did earlier by showing that a smallest counterexample proof is essentially the same, the same argument, just in a slightly different direction. So if you're ever asked to prove something by induction, you can, you can try to prove it using the smallest counterexample. And as an example of this, let n be a positive number. Uh, let's prove that the sum of the first n odd integers is equal to n squared. So the sum of 1 plus 3 plus 5 all the way up to 2n minus 1, that equals n squared. The sum of odd numbers adds up to be a perfect square. So we will prove this. We will prove um, this using uh, the, you know, we'll prove this by smallest counterexample. Let me phrase it that way. By smallest counterexample. Great. How does one do that? So then we, we talk about that. So like by proof of, by, by way of contradiction, assume, uh, you know, assume the statement is false. Statement is false. Okay, so then by the well ordering principle, our WAP right here, right? By the well ordering principle, there exists a smallest, a smallest counterexample. Um, let's call it K, a call a smallest uh, number K, uh, such that one plus three plus five going all the way up to 2k minus 1, this doesn't equal k squared, all right? Uh, so we can then kind of check. So we have the smallest counterexample, right? So we can notice, like note, that k doesn't equal 1 since 
Um, in that situation, you get one equals one squared. So the sum of odd integers from one to one is just one, and then one, that's equal to one squared. So case not one, because that would be sort of like the, the, the that, that doesn't work here, right? And so then let's consider the number smaller than k, right? So note also that k minus one is less than k, right? Um, and so because of that, since it's smaller than it, that implies that one plus three plus five all the way up to two times k minus one plus one, uh, sorry, minus one there. This is equal to k minus one squared. So because k minus one is strictly smaller than k, and that means that the statement has to be true for that one because k was the smallest situation where that actually works. And so when you actually start putting these things together, then if you were to take, if you were to take this, this statement right here, um, you can see that this thing is going to be equal to k minus one, k minus one squared plus two k minus one. Because basically, if you take the first, the first, the sum of the first few terms here, which is this friend right here, that's going to equal k minus one squared. And then if we start working through this equation, notice if you FOIL out the k minus 1 squared, you get k squared minus 2k plus 1 plus 2k minus 1. Uh, you're going to see some cancellation right there, right? 2k cancels with the 2k, the 1s cancel, and you're left with just k squared. And so this right here then shows that the k minus 1 uh, Basically, you, you'd see that it's like, oh, it violates that, right? So we get a contradiction at this moment because we assumed that K was a counterexample. So this st statement didn't happen, right? Equality did not hold right here, but it did. We showed that it did, right? And so we got a proof by contradiction. And so therefore, therefore, the statement, you know, the, the statement holds for all, for all natural numbers. Statement holds. for all n. And so you can see in this proof how similar this proof by smallest counterexample feels like an induction proof, right? Because kind of like we kind of have like an, we have an assumption, kind of like the induction hypothesis that follows because of our counterexample. It's not exactly what happens. But the fact that k is the smallest counterexample means its predecessor has the property. So we kind of get our induction hypothesis. Then we show that because this statement holds, it holds for k, which gives us a counterexample because K was the smallest counterexample. Why did we show? Why did we show that K couldn't equal one? Well, the reason we show that K didn't equal one is because uh, in our original assumption, K was supposed to be a po or N was supposed to be a positive number. So is K minus one positive or negative? Well, if if K is bigger than one, then K minus one will be positive. So we had to kind of do this initial case to make sure that didn't happen there, kind of like a base case. This proof by shortest smallest counterexample is very much the same proof um, as an induction proof. And so although this doesn't show the two techniques are logically equivalent, you can see here the similarities and I think you can kind of imagine how the rest of it would work. Um, so this finishes our uh, lecture five about induction. This is hopefully a good review. Uh, this probably is not your first exposure to induction, but we can always benefit from some more practice. Uh, we'll use induction uh, throughout this semester uh, in this course, right? And so feel, feel free to use it on assignments homework and proofs that you yourself are doing, and we'll use it in proofs we see all the time in abstract algebra. Um, if you liked what you saw or learned something, feel free to hit the like button. Feel free to subscribe if you want to learn some more about abstract algebra or other uh, mathematical topics. And if any questions come up along the way while you're watching these videos, feel free to post those in the comments below. Hopefully I'll see you next time for lecture six. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye.